Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this amazingly last day of January. And uh, we're still recovering from the Bengals football loss, but in, um, in uh, uh, football parlance, we're kind of towards the end of the first quarter already in the session. So things are flying by. Um, so today we're, we have three bills, um, all kind of re related thematically um, around the issues around, of equity and identification and um, looking forward to a really great hearing. We're going to roughly spend about a half hour on um, each of these bills, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, uh, depending on uh, committee interest. So I wanted to just uh, let the committee know just the uh, uh, we'll try our best to keep to that parameter. Um, and so our, we have a quorum, and our first item of business is um, a motion to move the minutes. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In reviewing the minutes, I don't see any uh, errors at this time, so I will move the approval of the minutes. Okay. Uh, discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Uh, our first bill on the agenda is House File 490. Uh, this relates to retroactive driver's license reinstatement. And um, just uh, before I move uh, uh, Chair Becker Finn's bill, I wanted to just uh, give a quick history of this. Um, uh, the whole um, retroactive uh, issue was uh, addressed and passed in this committee in 2021. Uh, part of it was uh, adopted into law, um, but in the conference committee, this piece fell off in 2021. So we're now um, revisiting that, and um, I appreciate this bill very much and your work on it, Chair Becker Finn, and I, I also want to acknowledge the bipartisan nature of your co-sponsorship. And so with that, I will move that Chair Becker Finn's bill, uh, House File 490, um, uh, be moved and uh, with a referral to re-referral to Ways and Means. Uh, welcome to the committee. It's always great to see you and please let us know about your bill. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein. And as uh, Chair Hornstein mentioned, this, this is not a new issue before us, but I realize there's a lot of new members since uh, we originally passed this bill. So um, we had an underlying larger bill that included, um, that did include the retroactivity piece uh, essentially making it so that you couldn't have your, you could get your driver's license back if it was taken away because of failure to pay or failure to appear. You know, neither one of those things is actually related to safety or your ability to drive. And so we passed kind of a larger bill and it's now in effect. And so now we sort of have these folks who are still impacted by those old policies that we're no longer inflicting upon other people um, moving forward. We want to go back and make it easier for those folks to get their driver's licenses too, because if we want them to pay their fines and fees, we want them to be working. Um, <laughs> as we well know, after last night's discussion, um, having a driver's license uh, is really important. And so that uh, th that's the bill. You know, I can kind of dig into it um, a little bit further, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just um, including that retroactive piece for folks to get their driver's licenses back. The cost is, is really small. Um, most of the cost uh, could be absorbed. Uh, so the, the fiscal note's very small. It's actually just the cost to um, print and send letters to folks to let them know that they're eligible to have their driver's licenses reinstated. They would still have to pay the $20 fee, so there is some money coming back in um, through that as well. Uh, but again, uh, Mr. Chair, it's, it's a pretty straightforward bill and happy to have bipartisan support and happy to, uh, to take questions. Thank you so much, Chair Becker Finn. Does the committee have any questions of the author before we uh, have some public testimony? Hey, I don't see any. Um, so I would like to uh, first, uh, our first testifier is Mary Ellen Heng, the Deputy City Attorney well, Minneapolis will be joining us on Zoom. Yes, thank you, Chair Hornstein, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Mary Ellen Hing. I am the criminal deputy in the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. I've been the deputy for 10 years, been a misdemeanor prosecutor for 25 years here in Minneapolis. Um, a large part of our caseload since the day I walked in has been around driver's license violations. Um, uh, so I'm really excited to be able to testify here today in support of this bill. Uh, my office, along with the St. Paul City Attorney's Office, supported the bill that was passed last year. Um, 
I have spoken to their office, Jessica McConaughey, their criminal deputy. She is also in support of this retroactivity bill. Um, many of the reasons uh, Chair Becker Finn already stated, one, it's an equity issue. We have so many individuals that uh, are eligible for reinstatement if this passes. Um, and uh, my office has already taken some steps to try to address that even without this retroactivity. We've been reviewing old driving after suspension charges that are unresolved, reviewing their records, and if they would qualify for this, we've been dismissing those systematically, thousands and thousands of cases. Um, many of these individuals owe significant fines and fees to the point where they probably will never be able to pay them. Um, this will go a long way in helping them get reinstated, that will help them get jobs, that will lead to you know better housing. Um, and then um, finally, we are seeing since the pandemic, uh, many of these old, old driver's cases actually showing up in court because the only way a person could be reinstated is to be able to pay the fines and fees they owe, which as I said, are often in the thousands of dollars, or they have to appear in court and then the suspension will be lifted. And we are still going through the backlog. We have many serious cases from 2020 that are still unresolved. We certainly don't need to see these cases in the court system using court resources, public defender resources, prosecutor resources, simply so someone can get reinstated and try to move on with their life. So my office is fully in support of this bill. Um, we think it'll promote public safety on the road. The goal is more licensed and insured drivers on the road. Um, so I'm really appreciative of the time to be able to speak. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, and our next uh, testifier is uh, Joelle Sather, uh, who is the Assistant Public Defender in Hennepin County, also um, joining us by Zoom. I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. I Sather would say is correctly. correct. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joelle Sather, and I'm a public defender in Hennepin County, assistant public defender. The, state's pub the state public defender's office endorsed the legislation that passed in 2021 ending the driver's license suspensions for unpaid traffic tickets. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today in favor of extending the eligibility for driver's license reinstatement to those who were already suspended prior to the passage of that legislation. Um, I've practiced in Hennepin County for over 25 years, and for seven of those years, I handled only misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor cases, the majority of them being driving cases. The cost of each one of these tickets can exceed $800 when you add the fine and the associated fees. Most of the clients getting these tickets are the ones who have children to care for, that they drive older cars that tend to break down, and they live in areas where, that aren't near their jobs. Um, with the increased cost of almost everything these days, the economic strain that they are feeling is very real. And in my current assignment in the Public Defender's Office, I work with many clients who are making major life changes and wanting to address their old tickets and get their driver's licenses reinstated. Most of them have several tickets from their past. Um, most, most of the charges are driving after suspension or minor infractions and that are preventing their ability to get reinstated without first paying thousands and thousands of dollars in old fines and fees. The barriers that these old tickets present to the people who are trying to get reinstated is the most significant and common reason that my clients remain suspended to this day. What, what I think is unclear is how easy it is to get caught up in that system of suspension and resuspension. And many clients tell me that the cycle started when they forgot about or didn't pay a simple moving violation like speeding. They don't realize it until they get stopped and the officer tells them that they're suspended and gives them another ticket for driving after suspension. And now they either have to pay both tickets or they have to see a hearing officer to try to get a deal to reduce the fines. Now, if, they, if the hearing officer gives them um, a deal and they take it um, prior to the legislation that passed in 2021, taking that deal offered by the hearing officer would cause an additional suspension to their license, which most of my clients had no idea would happen. So they leave the hearing office thinking that they're legal to drive and they get stopped yet again and are told they're still, still suspended. Confused, they end up going back to the hearing officer asking what's the situation. They have to add another ticket to deal with and the, the hearing officer may or may not explain the series of suspension and that yet paying the ticket again will cause another suspension. And so that's how the cycle 
begins and continues and repeats itself. So ending the license suspension for unpaid traffic tickets in 2021 was a very big step, but we were very disappointed that people already trapped in that cycle were left behind. The um, House File 490 extends the relief to people whose suspension occurred prior to the enactment of the 2021 legislation so they can get their, le their license reinstated and drive legally, which for many will mean higher pain and more steady employment while they pay off their current court debt. I hope you will support House File 490 and remove suspensions caused by these older tickets. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there questions? Okay, um, members, this will be another uh, opportunity to discuss the bill uh, and uh, ask questions of the author. Um, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. And, and from the fiscal note, it looks like they, uh, and they anticipate there's about 8,000 people in this category now moving forward. And uh, I, I think the premise of the bill uh, and the previous bill has some, has some merit. I just want to just caution us all that, to remember that um, um, economic status doesn't necessarily excuse people for not paying fines and so forth, but we shouldn't also be punitive because of some of those things as well. So uh, it's just a comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, um, Lee Petersburg. Um, <coughs> any additional <coughs> questions or comments on uh, House File 490? Okay, any last uh, words or thoughts for us before we vote? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein, and, and to Representative Petersburg's comment. Um, just to be clear, this doesn't forgive any of the debt that they owe. It just makes it so that they can get their driver's license and hopefully then have better access to employment so that they can pay down um, those, those fines. So, uh, and again, yes, it, it is 8,000 people, which I think actually speaks to, and it's, it's retroactive, so that number is not going to get bigger. It's, that is the number to fix this retroactive piece. And um, I think it speaks to how far reaching this problem really is. So uh, appreciate your support. Again, this is this is the right thing to do. Um, I do have to think uh, Representative O'Neill was also very helpful in getting this passed initially um, and glad that we can hopefully um, maybe even get this done before the end of May. So uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for putting this bill early uh, in the year and uh, hopefully moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work on this over many years. Uh, I know that it makes a difference in people's lives, a huge difference. Uh, and so I appreciate the, uh, not only the bill, but uh, I know that um, Representative O'Neill has been very strong and uh, uh, you know, has articulated uh, many of the same issues that you have and look forward to that conversation uh, with both of you leading it uh, on the floor. So with that, members, I will uh, renew my motion that House File 490 be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. Thank you, Chair becker Finn. You're yeah. on your way to Ways and Means. Uh, members will uh, briefly recess. Uh, I know that uh, our next author is on his way, uh, <coughs> Representative Pinto. So um, we'll just... Um, Hold here for a couple of minutes, I'll and then send Representative Frazier as soon as I get back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just uh, just hold here for a couple of minutes, and uh, we'll hear our next bill once <coughs> Chair Pinto arrives.
Uh, I'm glad you were able to make it, and um, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, so I will be very happy to move uh, Chair Pinto's bill, House File 503, uh, and that is also going to be a re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. And again, a little bit of uh, oh, I'm sorry, we were at, we were recessed, so I'm officially reconvening the uh, the committee. So. Um, well, uh, with so that, uh, do I need to, to do all of that again? Okay, so I have to do all of that again. Um, I am going to uh, uh, move that House File 503 uh, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, and um, I'll just say again um, a little bit of quick history on this. We heard this bill uh, pretty late in uh, uh, the session last year, uh, and um, it's again, it, uh, Kind of have a theme today, and uh, this is another theme around uh, uh, licenses and the, the need for um, you know some uh, reforms to our, our process to help improve people's lives and uh, public safety as well. And so, um, very excited about this bill, and um, you know we're going to again move it a little bit earlier in the process to uh, allow for some time uh, uh, for good discussion. So. With that, Representative Pinto, uh, your bill is before us, and we appreciate your your work on this. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thanks, uh, members of the committee. Uh, one question, Mr. Chair. I guess I had thought that there was an author's amendment, but perhaps I was wrong oh, about yes, that. Oh, yes, there is, uh, the A1 amendment. Yeah. And I will move that if you can explain the A1 amendment, and that is um, to uh, get the bill in the shape that we should consider it. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, that the the author's amendment, uh, what it does is transfer money from the general fund to offset the projected impact to to other funds. Um, that uh, driver's license. The concern is reduce revenue from driver's license reinstatement fees, um, and the author's amendment would um, fix that to be sure that other organizations that receive revenues from those fees uh, would not be underfunded as a result. Hope that I'm saying that correctly. So I've moved the A1 amendment. It's before us. Are there questions? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the motion prevails. Um, we have House File 503 as amended now before us. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, th thank you, members. So uh, what House File 503 does is to create a low-cost path to valid licensure for people recently released from incarceration where their driver's license had been suspended or revoked for fines or violations incurred um, prior to incarceration. I should note just as context for this, I work as a prosecutor for Ramsey County outside the legislature um, and so have some uh, experience, some connection with this. So I should say I'm not so directly with this issue, but I know that there are people um, who before they are, before they enter custody, may have a driver's license that is, as I said, suspended or revoked because of a traffic violation, some insurance related violation. Um, the bill does not erase those obligations to, to pay fines uh, for those violations that were incurred before incarceration. What it does though is make sure the person when they get out of custody that they uh, have access to a driver's license so they can work, so they can pay those fines and can do what they need to do. Um, it establishes a, a reintegration uh, driver's license um, that lasts for uh, 15 months. Um, after, after 12 months, after 365 days, if it's not canceled, the person can apply for a regular driver's license. During that year, they have to make sure they don't have any, any further violations. Um, if they do, then uh, the reintegration license is suspended uh, and uh, they have to pay uh, the uh, um, uh, reinstatement fees for violations, et cetera. But this gives people a chance to start over. I've got two phenomenal testifiers here, um, and having given you a basic sense, I'd love to have them give you some more detail on why this is needed. Great. Um, so would you let, we, we'd have uh, Ms. Ringling first? Uh, is sure. that yeah, the if plan? that makes sense, I know Mr. that Eve Runyon is also uh, potentially available. Um, welcome to the committee. Uh, Welcome back. I know you gave some very good and compelling testimony last year, and um, we're really happy to have you back, and thank you for all the great work you do in the community. So please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and committee members for your time today and for considering the importance of a reintegration driver's license. My name is Jamie Rigling. I'm employed by U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services here in Minnesota as the Community Intervention Administrator. For over three years, I've assisted those transitioning 
into our communities from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Prior to this appointment, I was employed at the Bureau of Prisons as a reentry affairs coordinator in Waseca, Minnesota for nine years. Those leaving incarceration typically struggle to meet the basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, let alone the ability to pay these outstanding traffic fees that incurred before incarceration. As expected, when they're releasing from federal probation, they often have additional court-ordered obligations. Among them include com community service hours, mental health assessment, chemical health assessments, uh, securing and maintaining employment, child support. So for the past 13 years, I've witnessed hundreds of people released with an immediate barrier to driving from fines they occurred before prison. And those violations result in that suspension or revocation on their license that Ms. Sather talked about in her testimony earlier today. The, ten, the trend I began to see a few years back was these alleged offenses had been left in pending status in our state Minsis court system for several years and often more than a decade. I started noticing that should someone release from custody with three or more of those driving after revocation or driving after suspensions, and they actually pay the fines and they want to do the right thing, it led to greater consequences of losing their license for up to a year. In a few moments, you're gonna hear the impact that this had on one of my clients, and it was very difficult for me at first to even understand it, let alone explain to him not to pay his fees and fines, which Ms. Sather helped him with. Um, this would mean if a person was released in 2022 and they paid their three offenses from over a decade ago, they actually automatically faced an immediate barrier of a one-year suspension under the current DMV rules. In just my office, there are typically around 20% of my clients who this impacts immediately releasing from prison. On any given month, I have 140 to 160 people that I am working with for this driver's license reinstatement. It's difficult to guide them to employment, especially in greater Minnesota without the public transportation. After speaking to other service providers, and several other practitioners over the couple years, there was a unanimous realization that we needed to push for a reintegration bill. And we needed to elevate this to a level of a systems change, which is why I'm here before you this morning. Some of those have, some of you already have seen the support letters that were sent in. So thank you for allowing um, me to be here today. And I respectfully ask you consider how this legislation might change the trajectory of someone's life and their family's lives after incarceration. It's well documented that maintaining employment after incarceration re reduces recidivism, improves outcomes, and increases our public safety. Another positive for us all is now this group of licensed drivers would also be able to be insured on our roads, the same roads we're all driving on. Recently, I learned of two states Mississippi and Louisiana that have passed similar legislation to increase their public safety while empowering those releasing from incarceration with a greater opportunity to gain and maintain employment to pay those outstanding fees. It's my belief in Minnesota we can demonstrate similar support and offer an earlier transportation intervention by removing this barrier with the proposed reintegration driver's license. Thank you, Chairman Hornstein, and thank you, committee members, for your time and consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we have someone joining us online, uh, Eve Runyon, uh, the president and CEO of the Pro Bono Institute. So you can uh, hear from me. Welcome. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. My name is Eve Runyon. I am the president and CEO of a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. called the Pro Bono Institute. My organization seeks to promote justice for individuals in underserved communities and marginalized communities. Primarily, we work with major law firms and companies around the country to encourage lawyers to provide pro bono services to those in need. In Minnesota, we serve on the steering committee of the Minnesota Collaborative Justice Project, which brings together different organizations to improve reentry outcomes for individuals who are returning to the community from federal and state facilities. The Collaborative Justice Project includes representatives from law firms and companies in Minnesota, legal services organizations, the Department of Corrections, Bureau of Prisons, Minnesota Probation and Pretrial Services, 
as well as nonprofit organizations that provide services to individuals returning to the community. We understand the challenges that not having a driver's license presents to individuals trying to reintegrate into the community. It is a barrier faced by many of the individuals that the organizations and the collaborative work with every day and that we collectively serve as a project. Not having a driver's license impedes individuals ability to find and maintain employment, obtain housing and reestablish family connections, as well as attend treatment and other community supervision requirements that are necessary for reentry. Having a driver's license can be an important first step to successful reentry. I would like to thank the agencies that have provided technical assistance on this bill, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Human Services, and especially the Department of Public Safety. I would like to also thank the authors of the bill, Representative Pinto, Chair Hornstein, Representative O'Neill, and Representative Muller. Thank you for your time today and for this opportunity to share support of the reintegration driver's license bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there questions? Okay. Uh, our last testifier is Jovan Gentle, um, a local business owner. Welcome to the Transportation Committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Hernstein and committee members for hearing my story and consider a law that will positively impact those releasing from inc incarcerated and help reduce the number of unlicensed drivers on our roads of Minnesota. My name is Jovan Gentle. I have been married for 17 years and I have 10 children, range from 25 to 10 years old. My wife and I have had a carpet cleaning business in Savage, Minnesota for nearly a decade. I was sentenced to two years of incarceration at the Federal Correction Facility in Elkton, Ohio. During the time I was incarcerated, there was little reentry assistance due to COVID and their staffing okay. shortage. In June of 2020, I learned that I was not eligible for placement at the halfway house because of the amount of traffic tickets I had prior to my incarceration. That was not helpful. I needed to be in Minnesota so I could meet with DMV agents and attend court hearings related to these outstanding tickets. I contacted Jamie at probation and she connected me to a volunteer attorney who helped it clear up a couple of tickets to remove the detainer so that I could be transferred to Minnesota to begin sorting out the fees and fines from different counties. When I arrived at the halfway house, I learned I had over $5,000 in outstanding court fees for tickets that were decades old. I had several court hearings and made agreements with courts while paying fees. Little did I know by paying some of the tickets, the punishment would continue for six more months. When I found that out, I am glad that I had a good support system because it hit me hard. My self-esteem started to go down and defeat started to kick in. I almost gave up and went back to the lifestyle of driving without a license. I was putting strain on my family and I had already served my time and served my time of incarceration and was ready to live a meaningful life abiding by the driving laws. Because I didn't have a valid driver's license, I missed out on an employment opportunity. One of, one of those was making $24 an hour. I was not able, I was not able, I was not able to help with my part of business to drive the van for our carpet cleaning business. Worst of all, I couldn't drive my kids to and from school or their sports for the past couple years. I'm happy to report at the age of 42 for the first time in my entire life. As of last Monday, I am a valid driver. I drove here today legally with car insurance to assure you to pass this important law. Since I have achieved this accomplishment, it has increased my self-esteem and allowed me to help with some of the transport needed, transportation needed in our family. There is nothing more satisfying than dropping off and picking up my kids from school. I can run, I can run errands and drive the family van to clean carpets now. I know my, I know my friends and family and my wife are happy because it was draining 
on their time and energy, giving me rides all the time back and forth to work. It is my hope that nobody else endured this type of barriers for two and a half years like I did because of mistakes of driving without a license years ago when I was in my 20s or 30s. Thank you, Chair Hernstein and committee members. Please consider how important it is to have a driver's license upon release from incarceration to generate an income to pay the fines off. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for uh, sharing your story, and I think that that will, uh, well, and congratulations on your license, and I hope that, that your story will inspire us in the legislature to uh, move forward with this with this very important bill. Um, are there uh, questions of uh, our testifier, Mr. Gent? Okay, um, members, this opportunity to uh, have some committee discussion or ask questions of the author. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I think the purpose and, and reasoning behind this bill is, is a, a very worthy and <coughs> worthwhile to, to do. I think that's it's a way for us to, to help those out. My questions actually revolve around some of the mechanics of the bill that I think have some issues and, and would like some clarification on. So uh, first, uh, Representative Pinto, do you, uh, how do, how is law enforcement or the court system um, distinguish or, or know what the uh, reintegration license looks like? Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, Representative Petersburg, I'll do my best to answer the technical questions, and it may be that I need to, to, to phone a friend. But I, I, I think that the license would look, and please, I'll maybe ask Ms. Odegaard, especially who's helped put this together, um, or, uh, or House Research, but I think the, I don't know that it should make a difference to police or to the courts in terms of an interaction with, with them. I mean, it's, it's, the issue is really just it's a license that expires after a certain period of time, and so there'll be the expiration date, I would think. And again, please, somebody step in if I'm saying this wrongly. Um, so I don't believe that there'd be sort of a big marking on there, because I don't know what difference it would make to, um, uh, to otherwise to law enforcement, except for when, of course, it, it, it expires. Um, and then knowing if the person has a new violation, then at that point, the license does get revoked, and it'll be listed in the court records as being revoked, just like any other license. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Representative Pindo, that last statement is the very reason why they need to know. I mean, if if you if, if you are re having your license revoked for what a normal uh, driver's license would just get a fine, uh, there needs to be a distinction, isn't there, on, on how and what that happens? How would the court know that that's reintegration of license then if it's if there isn't any change? Chair Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Petersburg. Well, I mean, I guess what I was focusing on your question regarding there's no need for a particular marking on the license. They've simply got the expiration date, and just like you know, somebody's license can be revoked or not revoked. But in the in the actual, um, uh, if you're asking about there being keeping track in the records, then in, then in fact that's part of uh, uh, part of the the um, uh, you know the DVS records is saying this is this kind of license, but I don't think there's any need for a marking like that on the license. We, I'm not sure if we're talking past each other, but I'm, that seemed to be what you're asking about. I don't. There'd be no need for a marking on the physical license itself. The courts are not looking at the physical card. Representative Petersburg. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess maybe I'm just confused a little <clears throat> bit. If um, your integration license is revoked upon suspension of a violation that normally would have been there. When does that revocation occur? Does that not occur at the time of the violation, or does it have to wait for court hearings before that revocation occurs? Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Petersburg, uh, no, I mean, it, it kicks in right away, right? Then then on the, if a law enforcement officer has an encounter with somebody and they run the, the driver's license, the driver's license will then say revoked, right? Because the court records uh, just like any license, if it's revoked for some other reason. This is just saying the mechanics of revoking these licenses that kick in right away if somebody has a new violation. Representative Petersburg. Okay, thank you. I think I understand. So you can just nod your head if, if I got this right. So basically, uh, when somebody gets stopped with an uh, integration license and they have a violation that um, would automatically revoke this license, the police officer, as they run that license, will get be notified of that, and then they will take the license at that particular time. Is that correct? Right, thank you. The, the other question in regards to the mechanics is just uh, the on on your uh, A1 on line 1.16, there's $93,000 that go into the vehicle services operating account. 
uh, what is the purpose of, of dollars needing to go into there? Uh, Mr. Chair, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I may need I may need to especially phone a friend on this one because it's getting into the, some of some fiscal transportation fiscal mechanics. I'm not sure perhaps Mr. Burris may be able to help or uh, Mr. Lee, but I'll look to the chair to. We'll uh, ask our nonpartisan staff. That Thank question. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, uh, that amount that's in the A1 <coughs> amendment starting on line 1.16 is a transfer from the vehicle services operating account to the driver services operating account. Um, and that amount would match the, the identified foregone revenue in the fiscal note um, coming out of the, uh, or, or less revenue to driver services. So that would have the effect of holding the driver services operating account uh, harmless. Uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and, and maybe uh, to follow up with Mr. Burris, um, does that make the assumption that all of these transactions would be done at the state level? Uh, would there not be some of them being held at driver's registration level as well? Uh, Mr. Mr. Burris. Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, uh, Mr. Lee might uh, have some further comments, but uh, this just addresses the um, uh, uh, costs identified at, uh, at the state level, so DVS uh, operating account costs. Sure. Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, in the fiscal note on page three, moment, um, on the bottom of the page, the last three paragraphs uh, detail um, DPS's assumptions on um, the split between um, uh, uh, state uh, DVS stations and uh, DL agents. Um, so the second to last paragraph says, assume revenue loss of 1,248 to driver service operating account from waived fees from the filing fee. So that's not all of the um, uh, impacts to driver service, just the filing fee. But then um, uh, uh, the, the assumption in the paragraph above that is that 13% of the potential transactions are at the state um, operated systems and the rest are at the um, DL agents. And so the estimated uh, f uh, filing fee loss to DL agents is on the last paragraph. Um, so it assumes fiscal impact to non-collecting reinstatement and driver's license DL fees at uh, 455,000. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. So, and I'm not sure who can answer that question, but I don't see any kind of reimbursement to the driver's license exam stations for those losses of those dollars. Is that in here someplace that I just missed? Mr. Lee or Mr. Burris? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, no, there isn't There isn't a reimbursement to driver's license agents in the amendment. Uh, thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's kind of what I thought, too. And uh, I'm just concerned that, um, again, this is a situation where we keep the state and the state agencies whole, but those that are also working out there uh, that are going to be a negative loss aren't uh, recouped as well for, for some of their losses now, during this. It's, I'm not debating or arguing the validity of this bill. I'm, I'm just saying I think that's one area that we missed, and you may want to reconsider that and, and figure out how we can also keep the driver's license and, and deputy registers that do a lot of work for uh, the state, uh, keep them whole as well. Just, just a comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that input and, and, and the questions. Uh, are there further uh, questions or discussion? Yes, Representative Fogelman. Mr. Chair, um, am I understanding right that they still have to pay their fines if they get their license reinstated? They still have to pay their fines. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Fogelman. Um, yes, the, the, the unpaid traffic and criminal fines from violations prior to incarceration, those, those do need to be paid, correct, still? Representative Fogelman. Okay, um, so what happens if they don't pay their fines? Chair Pinto. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Fogelman, um, if they don't end up paying, that they have to pay those fines, let me just one second here, but I believe that they have to pay those fines before getting that full 
driver's license after the 365 days. I'm looking to see Ms. Ms. Riggling, Riggling um, is nodding. So yeah, they, uh, in order to get that full license, essentially what this does is set up a year long period after getting out of incarceration, says, listen, we're gonna give you this temporary thing. Uh, you need to not have any new violations and you need to pay off the fees from the old violations or you get a year to do that. If you do that, you're gonna get a regular driver's license. If you don't do that, well now you're in the spot of losing that, having new reinstatement fees, et cetera, and kind of putting back, um, you, you know, you're farther back. So they do have to pay those fees before getting that full driver's license after a year. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a question or comment from Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this would be to both you, Representative Pinto, but also to the testifier. Um, he stated that there was some, somewhere near $5,000 worth of fees. Oh. That That's a substantial lift in in one year's time, if you add, I mean, even even for someone who you know doesn't come out of an incarcerated scenario, is there something in place to assist in that? Because five thousand dollars worth of fees is substantial. I could understand six hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, somewhere around that, right. as an you know not quite an insignificant sum, but a sum that would be able to be paid. But five thousand dollars in one year—that's a heavy lift. Thoughts for me? To, you want to take that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative. The, what I do know is that there are some nonprofit organizations accepting donor dollars, and they do have micro grants to help people, and people can apply for these micro grants. Um, Mr. Gentle here, he called each hearing officer and had each court date, and he didn't end up paying all five thousand dollars of those fines. I think he got it reduced down to maybe fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars. He did not actually. He he worked really hard with Joel Sather, and if he had three tickets in a certain county, they'd mush them together and and then you wouldn't have that $1,000 fee. It might be four or 500. Does that make sense? So we're not expecting that anybody can pay that kind of fee and fine. However, if they're coming through my office, um, we have Second Chance Act money through the federal dollars. And um, if they meet the criteria and they're indigent, we can help pay some of those fees and fines. Thank you. Just um, thank, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just kind of a comment to the entire committee then that I appreciate that we have that sort of leeway where we're still holding individuals accountable for their actions because I know that they would want to be held accountable as well because they're actually pursuing uh, a reintegrated scenario in our in our society. But at the same time that we have that flexibility to make those those exceptions when, when we're talking about substantial sums of money. So I appreciate knowing that. Thank you for the question. Okay, members, um, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? Seeing none, um, Chair Pinto, closing comments. Uh, just thank you so much, uh, Chair and members, and I really think that this is a, a great way to use the um, transportation and the power that you all have to, um, to help make sure to in reintegrate people into our society and have them be productive and, and do all the good things we want them to do. So I really appreciate it. Um, Appreciate your support in the conversation. Thank you. Appreciate your work, the work of all the supporting organizations. And again, I, I see that uh, you've done some work um, with Representative O'Neill on this, and that's very appreciated as well. So with that, members, I will renew my motion that House File 503, as amended, uh, be uh, recommended, to, uh, recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next and final bill on the agenda is House File 282. Uh, Representative Frazier. Uh, welcome back to the uh, committee, uh, Representative Frazier. And um, we heard this bill last year. It was incredibly important and timely then. I would say it's even more so now in the moment that we're in. Um, and so, uh, again, we're sort of continuing along uh, our series of bills related to equity and transportation, identification, uh, sort of our theme for today and, and also uh, uh, on Thursday. So uh, with some informational hearings we're going to have. But uh, so today we are um, taking on House File 282, uh, collect, collection of race and ethnicity data on applications for driver's license and identification cards. So I will move that uh, Representative Frazier's bill, um, uh, House File uh, 282, uh, be before the committee with a recommendation that it be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee. This is a mandatory referral because of the data uh, issues in this bill. 
So welcome, Representative Frazier. We're very happy to have you. And please uh, let us know about uh, your uh, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, co-chair, and lead and committee members. I appreciate being here this morning. Had to run over through the tunnel after chairing the judiciary because you had Jamie Becker Finn over here earlier. Um, House File 282, what it does uh, in terms of collecting data. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we have an A1 amendment. I, I apologize. Uh, no worries. I wanted to get that off before us before your uh, testimony. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, this A1 amendment is uh, before us, and um, I will move that we uh, put this in the form that you would like to uh, have the committee uh, consider the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the A1 amendment, to describe it, it uh, aligns the appropriation amount um, in the bill to the cost identified in the fiscal note. It also uh, has the funding come from the vehicle. Oh, also has the funding come from the vehicle services operating account instead of the driver services account in the general fund. Thank you. So somewhat similar to what we had last time, uh, or last bill. Uh, is there discussion? Okay. Uh, I will again. Uh, Move the A1 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, the motion prevails. Now, uh, sorry for that, uh, Representative Frazier. We now have House File 282 as amended uh, before us. Proceed. No worries, Chair. Just keep me on my toes. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, House File 282, what it does is, is it, prov it provides and allows for the Department of Motor Vehicle to provide, um, to collect data, race data, demographic data on the application form. Uh, and then it allows them to share that data with the Department of Public Safety for the purposes of research, evaluation, and providing public reports. That's important because we know anecdotally, and we know from some of our local jurisdictions, not only in the state of Minnesota, but around the country, that we have seen some disparities in terms of who's pulled over, who's stopped from traffic stops, and then what ensues after those traffic stops happen. Simply put, this, uh, this mechanism here will allow us to collect information process that data and will help policymakers uh, be more informed as we're developing policies to prevent and cure those inequities and disparities uh, on traffic stops. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, that is uh, simply the gist of the bill. And I do have, there are testifiers here, so I will yield for a testimony. Okay, uh, let's see. Our first uh, testifier uh, will be uh, Pong Zhang from DVS, and that followed by Mike Hansen, and we have Justin Terrell. Welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, my, my name is Pong, and Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. I'm here to testify in support of House File 282, allowing for the collection of race and ethnicity data on the credential. Uh, this proposal was included in the governor's supplemental budget request last year and is included in this year's budget proposal as well. Uh, we support adding the, an optional field to the credential application to allow for applicants to self-identify uh, their race and ethnicity. Uh, collecting this data will allow will provide an opportunity for evidence-based proposals to reduce inequities in the state of Minnesota. As drafted, this proposal will allow for sharing of identified data with the Office of Traffic Safety, who you hear from in a minute here, uh, for the purposes of researching traffic stops. Uh, we also appreciate uh, the inclusion of the resources needed to support uh, this work. We support this proposal, and, and it's an, uh, we recognize that it's an important step forward in gathering data necessary to reduce racial disparities in Minnesota. Thank you, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Sean? Yes. Uh, Representative Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions. Um, I'm not sure who is best to ask for this question, but here it goes. Um, do other states do this already? Mr. Zhang. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, yes, uh, other states do this. Uh, we know of at least two. Um, Director Hanson might have a, a better uh, collection of, of those states. Um, but just for an example, Colorado does this optionally, like we'll, how we're proposing. And last year, uh, when we reached out to the state of Colorado, they had a 38% voluntary uh, disclosure from their applicants, a little bit over a million um, um, credentials with self-identified data. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, the follow up, uh, Representative Brand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The second question I have is to make this maybe more whole in terms of what we're gathering for data. 
Um, could it be something where we're asking folks that are from other states uh, to get the, their information from those other states to kind of make a more whole report on who's getting pulled over and um, that sort of thing as well? Because right now it looks like the bill only tackles Minnesota, Minnesotans rather, but maybe our report is missing opportunities to collect that data from other states as well. Mr. Song. Mr. Chair, Representative, I'll, I'll defer that question to Director Hansen, who will have a better um, um, uh, experience with working with the data. I don't know if you want to take that question now. Uh, okay, well, I mean, Mr. Hansen, now if you wanted to take a crack at that, we, I know you're testifying, so maybe. How about this, sure. uh, Representative yeah. Brand? We'll have. Um, um, he, um, um, Mr. Hansen's our next testifier, so he'll answer your question. But we do have set, uh, a number of member questions now popping up. So first is Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, actually, this is a really important is issue in my district. And in fact, our police department has put in place a process to collect that data on their own to try to dig in and understand issues that are happening. My, my, my question is, will this help that in any way? Like how, with a, with a local police department, how will that work? Mr. Song. Mr. Chair, Representative Kraft, uh, our intention is to not share any of this data with local law enforcement. Now, how the data will be uh, shared um, from the Office of Traffic Safety, that may have influence on, on, on policies and practices of local law enforcement. Uh, but our, our intention of, uh, with this proposal is to not share any of that race data with law enforcement. Good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quickly on the logistics of this. So when the optional uh, indication on the license it just lists like a variety of races and ethnicities to choose from. I assume there is uh, no verification, like you can identify with what you want, or how, how would that work? Mr. Zong. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative West, yes, our intent is to have applicants self identify. Um, and uh, th uh, the, our current process, as we have it planned, is so that applicants and actually can select multiple. Um, um, race and ethnicity categories as they so choose. Representative West. And then uh, uh, quick, if you can give me a nod to let me know the next question here. Uh, so this is printed on the license if they do it or no? Okay. Uh, no, that's all. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Norris is next. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and my question actually relates to uh, looking at data around when people actually obtain their driver's license for the first time. I, prior to joining the legislature, ran a program that in part helped low-income students uh, get access to driver's ed and then ultimately uh, get a driver's license. And one of the things we're interested in looking at, are there disparities uh, in terms of race or ethnicity between you know, uh, when someone actually is able to obtain that driver's driver's license for the first time. And so would this data be able to be used for that purpose to identify any of those disparities that might exist in our state so we can figure out some solutions if they do exist? Mr. Zong. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, yes, the, the data will be available. Um, it, it will be classified as private data. Uh, but under private data, we can uh, summarize the data and um, an analysis like that uh, with our current MinDrive system would absolutely be possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. Uh, Representative Sensen Marira. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is about the A1 amendment, and I apologize if um, you talked about this and I just missed it, but I did see there's a, um, a part of the A1 amendment that talks about inserting, including associated activities of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Um, and I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about um, what some of those activities might be. Do we have staff that can speak to that? Thank you, Representative Frazier. Um, I'll ask uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, if you turn to the fiscal note um, on page um, four, uh, you'll see right at the top of the page, your criminal apprehension fiscal 24 
Um, this is uh, DPS's estimated cost to develop data schema described um, and programming costs related, and those are the BCA related costs. <coughs> that adds to the um, uh, 75,000. Representative yeah. Sensenmayer, do you have a follow up? Um, thank you for that. And um, so it's for the BCA to kind of, as I'm understanding it, analyze that data. Um, what what would be done with the data after it's analyzed? I'm not sure who that question is for. That's probably maybe for Mr. Zong. Uh, Mr. Chair, can, I'm sorry, can we repeat the question? Um, so, Sensimura. yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the fiscal note and it talks about um, there's a cost in here for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to analyze the data. Um, and I'm wondering what will be done with the data after it's analyzed. Mr. Zhang. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll take a stab at this, and I see Jordan walking out. Uh, the, what the BCA is doing here is uh, setting up the, the interface in which law enforcement accesses the driver's license data to ensure that race data will not come through when, when they're accessing uh, the DVS data through the, the law enforcement portals. All right. Okay. I think Mr. Haldofter-5 uh, was satisfied with your answer. <laughs> That okay. Um, <laughs> any follow-up? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, the Representative Elkins. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in Bloomington, I know that the police are already collecting this data during traffic stops so that they can evaluate their own performance to make, make sure that uh, there's not a disparate impact on, on people of color. Um, this would be a lot easier for local police departments to do if they did have access to that data. So why wouldn't we want them to have that ac access to that data, at least for analysis? Mr. Zhang. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Elkins, uh, I, I, in working with community, I think one of the common themes we've heard is that um, we didn't want the data to influence the interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, and after hearing from community, that's uh, the reason why we, we took this approach of not sharing the data. Uh, that data will be available after the fact, though, as uh, Director Hansen's team uh, does their analysis, we will be able to provide by citation, and, and Director Hansen will go into much more detail about this, um, data um, by, by, law, by agency. Yeah, Mr. Just to follow up, I, you know, I would just ask the, um, you know, the author and the department to consider uh, the possibility of uh, um, just allowing aggregate reporting of the data. I, I, Mr. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Elkins, that is the intent. The intent is to be able to collect these reports, do an analysis, and then to share that with a particular jurisdiction. So to your question as well, Representative Kraft, the uh, local department uh, or local government agency will be able to see that data. It won't identify individuals. That's the privacy part that we want to maintain. That's the part that communities were worried about. Yep. Um, local law enforcement officers won't have access to that when they run the initial uh, license plate to stop. But we will provide aggregate data, summary data that shows the traffic citations, the pullovers, and then erase data cross-reference with that to see if there are any disparities. Just, Thank you, Representative Elkins. Just a follow-up comment, Quick, Mr. Please. Chair, is that uh, this afternoon in health, uh, I will be presenting a bill that includes uh, a similar provision. The Minnesota Department of Health is um, asking the health insurers to include uh, um, you know, a race attribute in their de-identified data sources that they use for health policy analysis for pretty much the same reason. It's good to see this is a multi-jurisdictional <laughs> issue. Uh, thank you, Representative Elkins. Um, I don't see any further questions. Uh, Mr. Zong, thank you for uh, thank you. your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Mike Hansen, the uh, director of the Office of Transportation, uh, Traffic Safety. And um, also just, Thanks yeah, I think there were a couple of uh, questions uh, uh, that were directed your way. So included that, if you can include some answers in your testimony, that would be helpful. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning and members. Uh, my name is Mike Hanson. I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Office of Traffic Safety within the Department of Public Safety. And I'm also here to testify in support uh, of this bill. Um, I'll keep my re remarks very brief and then uh, hopefully be able to touch on the questions uh, that the members may have. Um, this is a, a good step forward in bringing additional transparency to the world of traffic law enforcement. And uh, one of the, the keys to making traffic law enforcement work within any community is that the community supports it and they buy into it and they understand it. 
And by providing this type of data, uh, eventually, when we have a large enough uh, base to pull from, we can, we can pull those curtains back and we can show the community what is actually happening um, with traffic law enforcement in any particular area. Using that anonymized data, we can provide a variety of different kinds of reports that agencies can use, that uh, policymakers can use um, in order to, again, improve that transparency and improve the community buy-in and improve the community support for traffic law enforcement because that is a very important public safety aspect to traffic law enforcement. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I don't remember specifically the questions that were brought forth, but I'm uh, happy to take a swing at it uh, for if members have questions. Yeah, I think Representative Brands uh, had a question around the um, uh, out-of-state uh, uh, nature of this and sort of the Minnesota jurisdictional opportunities and limits here. Did, did, you, did I phrase that correctly? Mr. Chair, Representative, um, it, it will be a little bit difficult for that because the states that are doing the, the racial and ethnic data collection are using a variety of, of different ways to do this. And many of them are using um, officer identification only. And so there is not a database that we can link to the Minnesota database to track that. So it would be, at least under current circumstances, it would be a little bit difficult for us to be able to pull that out-of-state data in. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess just to this point, um, uh, my understanding is that in Colorado, you know, this is working. Um, that some of the preliminary data, you know, has shown that from a, a safety and equity lens that, that this policy has been working. Is that, is my understanding correct uh, on that? Mr. Chair, members, yes, that is my understanding as well. And uh, Connecticut is also looked at as a model. Um, they were kind of one of the first states to jump in um, with the, the, the data collection that we're discussing here today. And have really uh, built a model that many other states uh, have adopted. I think the last count was five or six additional states were adopting that Connecticut model when it comes to looking at racial and ethnic data related to traffic stops and traffic citations. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to hear a uh, question from Representative Kraft and then Representative Olson. Representative Kraft. Yes, um, I want to follow up on the line of question around the local connection. Um, I will say I think this is a really important bill to start getting data and understanding what's going on. So I'm very supportive. Um, when, you t when it was talked about that intention was to provide summary level analysis data to individual agencies, what, what timing c could that be expected to happen in? Is it like on a monthly basis? It would be in a yearly basis? Have, have you thought that, that through? Mr. Hanson. Mr. Chairman, Representative Kraft, a, a very good question and, and something we're very open to looking at. Um, certainly, it's going to take a couple of years, three years, uh, before we really have enough uh, opt-ins, so to speak, uh, for us to start to take a look at this. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, the type of report, once we get the coding written and all of that, and working with uh, <laughs> Director Zhang and, and his uh, team, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be too difficult for us to pull this, you know, on a quarterly basis, on a monthly basis. Um, certainly, I, I, I would imagine that, that uh, our office will be responsible for some type of uh, an annual report mm -hmm. as well uh, to the legislature. So I, I think that there's a lot of room here, and this is a, a great complement to another uh, governor's budget uh, um, item that, that is, we're moving forward for the Office of Traffic Safety, which deals with a, a data analytics center. And this would be able to feed into that and some of the other databases that we're using as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Kraft. One more. Yep, Mr. Chair, um, I would encourage, uh, building on what Representative Elkins said, that as you implement this, that you reach out to the agencies that are doing this. St. Louis Park, Bloomington, and they're using an officer identification approach. But I know the council there is very interested in the data, and so um, in making that connection, uh, I think, would make this be really valuable. So thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, Mr. Hanson, I'm glad you mentioned the governor's budget, so I'll let the committee know that we're going to hear that budget on February 9th. So uh, mark your calendars for that. Um, Representative Olson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe it might be uh, to Mr. Zhang, and I'm sure he'll, he can come back up here if, if this, in fact, is a question towards him. But he stated that uh, I think it was Colorado had 38 percent self-identification on the, on the application. My concern um, is how are we analyzing that data? Are we going to be cross-referencing it with the U.S. Census, which would include uh, race and ethnicity on it? Or how, what happens if there is a, a disparity in individuals who are reporting? So, for example, we've got X amount of people in the population that are a certain race or ethnicity, but on the, on the licenses we're seeing a disparity, like a vast disparity in percentages of that race uh, that is not reporting on the data. How are we able to to utilize this appropriately to make sure that we're looking across a broad range and including everyone to have accurate data? Mr. Jean. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I actually think that might be a question best answered by Director Hansen in terms of the analysis of what the, what the data collected. So I'll defer to Director Hansen. Director Hansen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Olson, uh, a very good question. And you know, I'll venture out on a little bit of a limb here talking for my research team, but there there are certainly that proportionality is something that would be very important for us uh, to pay attention to that, you know, the, the opt ins are, you know, we have a proportion that matches their population in the overall population, but there are methods and techniques that the researchers can use to uh, to normalize that data and to even it out. Um, and so I would anticipate that that's what they would happen if we did find one particular demographic that was under-reporting or under-opting in. Yeah, just to follow up. Yep, I, uh, Olson. That, and, and the fact that you're aware of that potentiality is encouraging to me because, I mean, we could utilize that for all sorts of things. You're looking at the U.S. Census data that says this is the percentage of our population that is of this race, and this is the percentage of the population yep. that only has this amount of licenses. You know, even not even in in looking at self-identifying, but just saying, hey, there's a huge disparity in, in license holders, um, not even just traffic stops or you know police uh, interactions, but just people who have licenses based off of our population. So I'm glad that you're, you're aware of this. Um, I, think it's, I think it would be a necessary aspect if we're going to do this form of data collection to, to be able to get so much more out of this than just how many police or traffic stops are made based off of race and ethnicity. There's so much more that could be obtained through this. Thank you, Representative Olson. Um, Representative Sensimira. Yeah, thank you. And this is a little bit of follow-up to Representative Olson's question. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering about like the public education piece around this because, you know, if I'm thinking about the purpose of the bill, right, I think it's to like help us potentially gain data to understand if racial profiling is happening in traffic stops. But I could also see from a public point of view, if they don't have time to really dig into the policy, I can see fear around like, will this make me get racial profiled? Like, so can you maybe talk about um, when people are getting their driver's license and they are choosing whether to opt into this program, kind of what's the public education piece? Because um, so that we don't see disparities between some races are opting in and some races are opting out for fear of, of racial profiling. Thank you. Okay, that would be a good question for Mr. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Yes, um, that's something that we've heard from community as well. And as we talk about how do we, you know, get the most voluntary um, um, uh, submitted data, uh, that that education piece is is, is a critical uh, uh, a critical work that needs to happen before this rolls out. And and we do we we hope uh, that the, we see this bill um, uh, get passed, and and that we, we we're excited to do the work to work with the community to educate the community on how the data is being protected. Um, how, how the data will be used and the value that it adds to the, over, the overall uh, benefit to Minnesota. And so um, uh, there's work to be done there and we're, we're excited to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Follow up? Okay. Good. Well, that uh, concludes our, our member questions for uh, our um, testifiers from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, we have uh, an additional uh, public testifier Justin Terrell is here from the Minnesota Justice Research Center. Good morning. Mr. Terrell, it's so, so great to see you again, and um, we appreciated your testimony last year on this bill and all of your great work in the community. And uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein. Um, 
Justin Terrell, Executive Director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. Uh, I'm excited to be here to uh, testify on behalf of this bill once again. Thank you, uh, Representative Frazier. <clears throat> the Minnesota Justice Research Center is a, a 501c nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to transform the criminal legal system, and we use research, education, and policy development to do that. In regards to the bill that's in front of you today, and you've, had, you've asked all the right questions and, and dug into all the right issues, I will just say that, you know, under the authority of the system, uh, we must have quality data. This is something that we're really concerned about in the, from a community perspective to make sure that we are able to give people the full and not the half when it comes to what is happening to people when they are in the custody of the state. That is, we are, the state is responsible to administering justice. And when people are in the custody of the state, we need to have transparent data so that we can talk about what happens to folks when they are in that interaction, whether it's on the side of the road or sitting in a prison. And so I think this bill moves us in the right direction because it simply allows us to start tracking what is often referred to as anecdotal evidence. And this is an experience I had from the summer when we were shaping a consent decree in Minneapolis. A lot of folks said, of course, we have race-based policing in Minneapolis. But we were able to collect, the Department of Human Rights was able to collect the data to actually affirm those experiences. And so it is completely responsible for the Department of Public Safety to collect this data, to learn, to digest this data, and to learn from it. And you'll see me over and over and over again this session encouraging you all to collect the data, to digest it, to analyze it, to report on it, and to build policies and craft policies that help us move forward. In my closing uh, comments, I'll just say, you know, unfortunately, on Friday, we all had to witness another black man brutalized by uh, law enforcement on TV on a prime time Friday. And I'm assuming and hoping and praying that everyone in this room is tired of that. I know on the community side, we are tired of that. And the one key strategy in disrupting this is by making sure we are collecting data, learning what we are doing with people in the custody of the criminal legal system, and building and crafting policies that help us get a, a pathway out of this nonsensical, repeated violence pattern of violence that we find ourselves in. And so with that, I say thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative uh, Frazier, and all the members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your work and your comments. Um, members, that concludes our uh, public testimony. Is there anyone else uh, who would like to testify on <coughs> file 282? Okay, members, this is uh, another opportunity for some committee discussion or questions of the author, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to the author, uh, Representative Frazier, um, it appears that this information is voluntary and it's not mandatory. Is that going to be clearly uh, re referenced to the people that are that are going to be self-identifying? Representative Frazier. That will be made clear that it's voluntary, not mandatory. Okay. Uh, thank Representative you. Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my final question is, it's, it's unclear, but it appears that this is only for uh, new applications and not for renewals. Is that correct? Currently, that is I'm correct. Sorry, Thank you. Those are the mic, too. It's, oh, sorry. I'm being uh, informed that it is for all. Okay. I, I just see it for applications, which is different than a renewal. So that's why I'm, I'm not sure it's clear in the bill. So. Mr. Chair. We'll have uh, Mr. Zhang uh, answer that. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brett Petersburg, yes. Uh, this will, this uh, data will be collected optionally at the at the time of renewal or new application. So um, any application, anytime someone renews or, or applies for a new credential, they do have to fill out that application. Um, and it's the same application. And so um, that will, it will be collected at that point. It's also noted that it will take, um, Dr. Director Hansen um, also noted this, it will take about four years to get through a whole renewal cycle here in Minnesota to have uh, what we would consider complete data. Um, but we, we're excited to start collecting data as, as soon as we can. Where was the Petersburg? Uh, uh, thank you for that clarification. I just, it just wasn't clear. So I'm glad that the intent is, is clearly stated today that it's going to be for, for everybody and for those that uh, choose not to be labeled, uh, they don't have to, to fill it in as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this one uh, just kind of came to me here. What 
what data points are being accumulated through this? So I put in, you know, my race <coughs> onto my license application. Is that just there is one more white guy who has a license? Or are we looking at it every time the police run my license, then it pings it and says, here's the race of an individual who was stopped for excessive speeding? Uh, if, if they could answer that question. Okay. That may be for staff, but the, the intent is that that information will be collected and when we cross-reference to run their reports, then they can cross-reference and see what the race of the individual was that was stopped in that particular traffic um, incident and then, uh, then create the reports based on that information. Representative Wilson, would you like any additional commentary from um, the Yeah, I would agency? just like, yeah, I would, thank you, Mr. Chair, just a clarification that every time my license would be run by a police officer or anything, then that would ping a data point and, and accumulate it into the database. It's not just I get my license renewed and I say what my race is and then we have one more person with a license on that race. Because that, that form of data doesn't seem like it's all that, you know. Okay, let, let's, yeah, let's have someone from uh, DPS. I don't know if this is Director Hansen or Mr. Zhang or both. Director Hansen will take that one. Mr. Chair, members, um, if I understood the correction or the question correctly, it's it's how are we going to you know match the racial identification against whatever happened in the field? Is is that a fair summation? Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Basically, every time a piece of data is collected, what, what pieces of data are going to be collected? Is it just when I apply for a, for a new license or my renewal for my license or, you know, I change my address and now we, we can track the race of an individual who has changed their address? Or is it going further to every single time um, someone is stopped by the police, every time they're their license is is checked for you know uh, purchasing a firearm or anything like of that aspect. Where are where are the data points being collected and for what reasons are they being collected? Director Hanson. It's a very good question, uh, Mr. Chair and yeah. members and Representative Olson. A, a very good question, and I think some of those questions will have to be answered as we move our way through this process, because I think you know. Data and big data, um, you can do a lot of different things with it if you can tie the sources together. And so certainly the intent, is, as I understand it, uh, is simply to use this racial and ethnic identification as it relates to traffic law enforcement activities and not anything outside of that. Um, certainly, you know, is that something that, that may evolve in the future? Um, it, I guess it probably could, but as I understand, at least from, from my perspective and where the Office of Traffic Safety would be involved in, is looking at this strictly in the realm of traffic law enforcement. Uh, just so one final comment. I mean, whereas some of this, you know, this is, you know, we've got some noble and, and grandiose ideas for some of this data collection, but I think that sometimes we can get into a position where we start falling off the edge of too much data collection. I mean, uh, you look at my, I pull out my license to prove that I can purchase alcohol or purchase tobacco, and then we're starting to get so much data that potentially is not necessary or so much data that we're starting to infringe upon uh, other areas of life. So um, I hope that this is a, a, a fairly narrow scope and sequence for right now to get to a point of something that is potentially an egregious uh, overstepping of bounds in our society. But then, you know, if we do end up, I just hope that the floodgates don't open to a wide point where we lose control of this river. Thank you. Uh, Representative Elkins. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chair, but uh, it was, I, I hope my question was going to be uh, answered uh, in response to Representative Olson's question, but I think this is a very important question is, is a record, a stock record created whenever a citation is issued or whenever the driver's license is checked? Because an important thing that we're trying to analyze here is the, the pre prevalence of, um, uh, what are they called, um, senior phages kicking in. Um, pretextual stops. So would a, you know, it, it, so you would catch pretextual stops if there's a license check but no citation. You would not uh, correct, collect data about pretextual stops if the record is only created if a citation is issued. 
Representative Frazier. Just quickly, uh, Representative Elkins, thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Representative yeah. Elkins, thank you for that question. It's, it's more than just uh, pretextual stops currently are, are legal. Um, so it's more than just capturing that. What it's capturing is they will be able to collect the data and cross-reference that data based on that stop, cross-reference that data with the licensor of the individual that's captured, and now they'll be able to have the race and ethnic data on that individual, and then be able to run an analysis and a report that shows whether or not we're seeing disparities. Uh, because the whole issue is whether or not these pretextual stops are based on race, whether it's racial profiling. Representative Elkins, a follow-up. Yeah, this, the, the question really is, would a pretextual stop generate a record? That's probably one for Director Hanson. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair and uh, members, um, in the vast majority of law enforcement agencies that I'm familiar with, yes, every contact, every traffic stop results in some type of a record being generated, whether it's a CAD event or a citation issued or a warning, a written warning issued or something like that. Um, there is a, a record built. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Representative Fogelman. Mr. Chair, um, I guess my question is, you don't have to opt into this. So what kind of percentage of participants are needed to make this relevant? And what do you do if you stop, how is it affected if you stop someone without a license? Um, I think we'll ask, uh, maybe we should have uh, Mr. Hansen just <laughs> yeah. stay here for a little bit. We have, we have eight minutes left, maybe you should just uh, park yourself here at the, at the table. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Director Chair. Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative. Um, if somebody is stopped and they don't have a license, um, there would be no, uh, if they've never had a license, that they never would have had the opportunity to opt in and provide that racial or ethnic information. If, for instance, they did have a license but it was revoked or suspended or canceled and they had opted in, we would still be able to uh, uh, match that record up with that racial identification that they provided when they did. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Representative Fogelman. I guess I just don't know how it would factor in if it, to the whole thing that you're trying to get across because it's just, it's a little confusing. I guess that's, that is good for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone else on the list. Are there other members that have questions or comments? Any further discussion? Um, just before your closing comments, um, Representative Frazier, I would just wanna thank you. Um, I think this is uh, you know, an important bill. Uh, Representative Frazier and I were uh, just talking yesterday, I think, and I could be wrong in my legislative history here, but um, we haven't really done anything like this since the early 2000s. Um, and uh, so I think this is important that this issue be revisited. So much has happened since then. Um, it wasn't exactly this. It was a traffic stop study, I think, at that time. Uh, so this is a little bit different, but we're, we're getting at the same issue. Yeah. And so I thank you and uh, really appreciate the committee discussion on this bill, uh, um, you know, and also the other two bills we heard today. So um, before we vote, um, any closing comments, Representative Frazier? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, that study was done in 2003 in conjunction with the uh, University of Minnesota. And at that time, you had jurisdictions opt in. There were uh, a significant number of jurisdictions that did opt in. And it will be informative as we move forward to build this system out because they did account for uh, assumptions and estimations of uh, ethnic and race and drivers <clears throat> on the road to determine, uh, to make decisions about the statistical analysis that would happen to create those reports. And, and we haven't done anything since then. Uh, we, as uh, Mr. Terrell testified here, we have a lot of uh, anecdotes. We have reports from community um, around this. It would be great to have trans, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be great to have transparency and evidence um, to support that so to inform our policymakers as we're making laws and policies around these issues to uh, rectify and clear up any disparities that we do have. So I appreciate the support in this bill as we're moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Frazier. And so with that, I will renew uh, my motion that House File 282 as amended uh, be recommended and re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Thank you so much. You're on your way to the Judiciary Thank you, Committee. Mr. Committee. And uh, members, with that, uh, we have no further business before the committee. We have an informational hearing on Thursday and then uh, a number of items for uh, next week, but we'll get into that on Thursday. So uh, thank you again for a great hearing, members, and with that, we are adjourned.